Okay, I think we have uh, reached the five uh, minute uh, contemporary time. So this is the Thing to Thing research group. Uh, I'm Carsten Bormann. Ari Karanen is uh, uh, the chair who actually does the work. I'm, I'm just, uh, <clears throat> my name is just on, on the group. Um, this is an IPR uh, meeting. So uh, the IPR uh, guidelines of the IRTF apply. Uh, and uh, th there are some uh, more detailed note well slides that, is, that I assume you have uh, seen. So uh, we, we have uh, IPR disclosure rules that apply if you are talking about some technology and know that <clears throat> there are some patent claims to it, then uh, you have to tell, or you can choose just to not, not to talk about uh, the technology. Um, we, we try to be nice and try to be professional. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, it, it bears repeating that this is an IRTF meeting, so we are not forging standards here. Uh, we are trying to talk about research that, that may be useful for forging standards or for other uh, purposes. Um, and uh, we are also not an organization that, that has liaisons in any formal sense, uh, but of course doing research means that uh, you talk to a, a lot of people. So uh, do we have, uh, the, the blue sheet is in the CodeMD notes, which uh, maybe you can send around to the chat once more for people who came late. Thank you. Um, do we have note takers? So I think Ari is going to take some notes in the GoDMD. Does anybody else want to help? So everyone is, is free to participate in the note taking. This uh, GoDMD is open for any, anyone to update. So feel free to jump in whenever you feel like it. Yes, and, and don't just feel free, but actually do. Um, this is an IETF CODEMD, so um, if you want to log in, you can do this using Data Tracker. Uh, but I think the document is free for all to edit, right? I'm not seeing that at the moment. Yes, yeah, it's really up, freely editable. Okay, thank you. So we actually have a Jabber room. Uh, I don't know if anybody is. Uh, in there uh, right now. Um, we have a mailing list and uh, we have a repository uh, which uh, contains the slides and will contain any other documents that we want to uh, make available in, in, content, in the context of this uh, meeting. And of course, it contains the agenda. The agenda is, of course, also in the usual place in the uh, data tracker. So our agenda is, is uh, pretty full and I have already used the first uh, 10 minutes. So I have to really hurry up here because we are already uh, running uh, late. Uh, we have a couple of uh, talks. One is at the beginning and one is at the end for various uh, reasons. And the middle of this sandwich is uh, going to be an, a segment about industry. Uh, updates and I uh, lead into that uh, in a couple of minutes. Yeah, so we, we are interested in, in do, doing a research that is needed to make a true Internet of Things a reality, and we do this uh, cross uh, stack. Uh, so uh, we are not exactly starting at the antenna. The antenna. Uh, we are starting approximately where the IETF starts at the IP adaptation layer and we end with users and security and architectures and uh, data. And um, so if, if you want to visualize that uh, the, the uh, research group does some things, the, the IETF does some things, 
and we do have overlap lab, uh, occasionally, and I think we have been reasonably uh, uh, successful in managing uh, that overlap. So let me quickly mention how things are going to go on after this uh, meeting. Uh, the most regular thing that currently happens in the research group are the wishy calls, which are happening approximately monthly, maybe with a pause in, in August. And the next one is going to be on the 30th. Uh, during the IETF, unfortunately, that, that was uh, something we couldn't avoid. Uh, but after the last session of, of the IETF. Uh, so uh, unless uh, you're in China uh, and it's already past midnight, you, you might be able to uh, join. So we plan to also have uh, other meetings with other uh, organizations, uh, some, some more topic-based meetings maybe. Uh, we probably will have another summary meeting at or around IETF. Uh, 109, and, and we will learn in August whether that's a physical meeting or another online uh, meeting. And uh, yeah, the whole idea of co-locating with academic conferences uh, really is taking a break right now. But uh, of course, uh, at some point, we will be able to do that uh, again. And may maybe we also will find an online form of co-locating uh, that we have still have to invent. Okay, we have uh, uh, two uh, documents that, that are research group documents are, are trying to become one. Um, we're not going to talk about REST for Design today. We will talk about IoT Edge at the end uh, of the meeting. This is in research group adoption call. Uh, so uh, if you have an opinion on this, uh, please send a message uh, to the mailing list. And uh, also we are ramping up something called Wishy uh, notes and and right now this probably will start with some terminology but might uh, uh, grow to include other uh, things. Okay, Ari, do you want to report about Wishy? Sure, thanks, Karsten. So as, as many of you know, I mean, Wishy is this long-running activity in the Thinking Research Group where we've been focusing on semantics and hypermedia interoperability. And since the last summer meeting, we have had now four online meetings with a variety of topics. Uh, for example, there is this now new survey of semantics technology landscape that is driven by Milan Milankovic and Michael Koster. This work has two main parts. It first of all proposes a unified criteria for describing IoT data standards, but also provides a meta model survey of 14 different SDOs comparing both organizational and technical aspects of those models. Also, we have had Jonathan Berry to lead the discussion on the working of open API, async API, API description methods, and the IETF core technologies. And there we have been discussing a proposed way to extend the open API specs to support co-op features. Uh, we certainly have been for a year already collaborating closely with the One Data Model Liaison Group, and we've been exploring various research and standardization topics relevant for that work. And 1DM has also been a topic of multiple hackathons, and we've explored various architectural, semantic interoperability topics uh, in that scope. Uh, but most recently, we have been focusing on this potential standardization of the SDF language, and naturally, we have discussed the upcoming ASDF of quite a bit that Karsten will be discussing more a bit later. We also have continued our close cooperation with the W3C Web of Things, and in particular, we have explored the topic of how 1DM SDF and the uh, Web of Things thing description and thing description templates can work together. On Web of Things specific topics, um, we have been discussing enabling efficient discovery. And this discovery also relates to the close to the last topic of uh, this identifiers, reference paths, and pointers. How we can express the, all of these in efficient but versatile ways to enable discovery and, and other uses. And also one proposal coming out of this work has been this potential for JSON batch standardization. It's going to be discussed at the IETF 108 dispatch meeting. For Wishy, um, uh, the next slide we have a quick update on the Helsinki meeting. So we're planning to have a face-to-face -face meeting in Helsinki together with the W3C Web of Things. But due to Corona, this was also transformed in a half-day online meeting, but we 
still have been calling it in the Helsinki meeting. So in this meeting, we did discuss the Web of Things use case collection effort, just an effort with about 20 IoT use cases in the pipeline already. And Web of Things folks, they welcome everyone to contribute to this work and also use this information. Also, we discussed life cycle and discovery. Uh, those are topics that we have lots of common interest with Web of Things. Also, we discussed Web of Things smart and read proof of concept uh, activities. And we continue also in this meeting the discussions about 1DM SDF and how Web of Things team description could integrate and interwork together. In this meeting, we also briefly discussed the use and design alternatives of hybrid media controls uh, in team descriptions. Um, Ari, were there there are minutes taken for the, the workshop. Can we maybe put a link to those minutes into these minutes so people can easily find them? Absolutely. That also then links to the archived uh, presentations and so forth. That's a good idea. And I should say some of these are definitely ongoing. We have a very active discussion going on right now about hybrid media controls, for, for example. That if you're interested in that topic, uh, it relates also to dynamic TDs versus static TDs. Okay, so we will hear some more about uh, what uh, we're Okay, so the next, uh, after the, the introduction and the reports, uh, the, the next uh, uh, talk will be some uh, work on bringing Web of Things TSN and OPC UA together. Matthias, do you want to start to talk? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Karsten. Um, so, yeah, this is a follow up of a work uh, that uh, I presented uh, in Singapore. Uh, when the world was normal, and uh, it's in this category of semantics-driven connectivity, and uh, we now um, fill down some details and basically wrote it up together in a paper that's going to appear in the IoT conference um, in September this year, and it's about yeah bringing deterministic industrial networking to the W3C Web of Things uh, using TSN and OPC UA. Next slide, please. So uh, for the background, um, I, industrial IoT uh, usually requires something like deterministic networking or some special properties that pen, can be controlled uh, through the whole stack. And um, the main part here is that uh, the applications get some QoS guarantees uh, from the whole protocol stack. And uh, that mainly led uh, to this plethora of field buses that you can find in industrial environments. Uh, noteworthy there, um, it's like 94% wired. Um, wireless has a, a small uh, part here. Um, luckily, uh, it's going from just wires to something that is Ethernet based, um, but it's still uh, all um, different and not really compatible. Uh, some good uh, thing at the horizon is uh, time sensitive networking which is being standardized for now quite some time in the IEEE um, so it's based on standard ethernet it reuses the vlan headers uh, to encode some more information and uh, this way enables uh, basically a converged network that can also give um, these tight quality of service guarantees to applications but can coexist with normal it traffic um, one thing to consider here is it's uh, not just uh, plugging in your cable. Um, it requires a very detailed uh, network configuration as well. Next slide, please. And uh, for this, um, there are different models. Um, so you can do this centralized, distributed, or in some kind of hybrid way. Um, for now, the centralized model is kind of uh, the predominant way um, usually because historically um, these uh, deployments uh, in industry applications are planned and uh, then actually also uh, monitored and so on from a central place. Um, on the left hand side, you can see uh, how this works. So there are entities involved that are called like a centralized user configuration. That is something that can talk to the applications <clears throat> and understands uh, the application protocols. That then needs some uh, uniform interface to the so-called centralized network configuration. 
That is then something that uh, can talk to the bridges, so manage switches and so on in the network, and uh, basically um, does the resource um, allocation so that these guarantees uh, that were requested by the users can be met. And um, so in this world, um, one mainly uses Yang. That's uh, something that many of you might uh, know from this uh, core conf activity and the LP1 work. Um, often reported also here in the T2TRG. In principle, there would be multiple choices, um, like the historic netconf, uh, restconf, which is HTTP based and uh, would fit nicely in the web world, um, also coreconf. The thing is that uh, most network equipment out there is uh, still using netconf. So restconf is something that at least I mainly see in SDN controllers that uh, work with a lot of virtual machines and virtual switches. Um, but if you go to the physical world, you have to deal with netconf and uh, according young modules. So this is one, one thing we have to address. And then next slide, please. Then the other part to address is uh, how it looks uh, at the application layer. So um, industry, as usual, is quite uh, shielded. Uh, one uh, interesting um, technology here is uh, OPC UA, um, which is uh, luckily a cross-vendor application. So it's uh, supported by a large number of, of um, players in the industrial space. Um, overall, it has an interesting graph-based information model. So that's one of the main contributions here to agree on semantics as well. And uh, it defines uh, its own communication protocols under this, however. Um, it's um, mainly used as special binary format um, that can be used either as a client server. And uh, now slowly uh, coming up in products is a PubSub version of this um, that can have different bindings for cloud connectivity, for instance, MQTT, AMQP. Um, but to use it locally, it also works over UDP or directly over layer two. Um, so the, the most OPC UA applications at the moment, they take care of management and monitoring of such applications. However, um, on the right hand side, um, what is currently ongoing work is the so-called field level communications for OPC UA, which then extends this ecosystem to actually be able to also cover the controllers and end devices in the field and uh, to enable uh, real time applications. It integrates this uh, time sensitive networking that I just uh, mentioned and tries to um, provide a full stack for this. Next slide, please. So to give you an, a rough idea um, on the left hand side, you see a screenshot from one of the tools. Um, it uses um, this graph based uh, model that I mentioned um, in this tool. You can actually also browse through the data that is available on controllers, for instance. And it then has so-called nodes that are quite similar to resources, um, which is a good starting point if you want to include this uh, in the Web of Things environment. Um, so you can see in the on the left-hand side under value, there is this NS equals two, uh, which is a namespace. Um, so actually they use URIs, but they, they convert it to integers and uh, then follows a node identifier, in this case, a string, uh, this hello world. And uh, with this, you can identify a, a node or a resource. And um, a different is that they are strict uh, node classes. So unlike resources, which could be anything, um, there are only a certain classes of uh, resources possible with OPC UA. And uh, there are some more things that make it a bit less compatible with the web. For instance, the references in OPC UA are bidirectional. Uh, they are support um, for, for Bitmap data types, uh, they, they define word sizes, so you have to know if it's a 16-bit integer or a 32-bit integer, unsigned and so on. So things um, that uh, were actually already solved on the web, but still used in these kind of um, yeah, partially low-level applications. Good. Next slide, please. Um, the last ingredient is the Web of Things. I don't think I have to tell this group anything more about this. Um, so it's uh, using this um, overall ecosystem that uh, mainly focuses it integrating different application domains. So for instance, industrial automation with the building automation or energy management. 
And uh, this is why we want to uh, bring the time sensitive networking and OPC UA uh, also in this scope. Next slide, please. Good. So what do we uh, really want to achieve? Um, I just summarized and uh, how should it look like? Next slide, please. So on the left-hand side, you see um, what we call a servient, uh, which is uh, like the, the Web of Things uh, software stack that is able to run uh, applications that are written against the uh, scripting API. And what runtime then handles these abstractions and uh, is able to communicate with so-called protocol bindings um, here, colored in green. And uh, here, basically what we did is we provided two bindings, one for OPC UA, uh, for the operational part and netcon for the uh, network configuration. And the overall uh, flow uh, works like this. So on the right hand side, um, I think I can't use my mouse or anything. Uh, you, you see um, the devices, they would all get a thing description, um, but uh, we also provide a quality of service um, vocabulary. So those can be annotated with the capabilities um, what these devices can provide, so how fast they could send data, how uh, quickly they could uh, receive data, and uh, some other properties. And uh, this then has to be combined with the QS requirements on the left-hand side of, uh, for instance, a controller application. So only the, this application actually knows what uh, cycle times, so meaning how often uh, does uh, a control loop have to be triggered, uh, how often sensor data has to arrive, and this is defined by the application and it must match that to the capabilities of these things. And uh, with this, it can then basically uh, request a network configuration that would suit this uh, controller application um, that has to talk to certain devices. Um, the concept here is that the controller app can talk uh, through uh, Web of Things interfaces. So basically by consuming a, a virtual thing here, um, the TSN scheduler app, which uh, can also run on, uh, on a servient, that scheduler app then basically calculates from the requirements. So which communication is required, a network configuration, um, then pushes this out uh, through the netconf bindings. So basically talks to, to these uh, switches Sometimes it's actually also antivices that support this protocol and are configured this way. And if this is successful, it uh, will respond uh, positively to the controller app, which then can start uh, operation through OPC UA. Good. And um, in the next slides, I will present the, the building blocks that we provided. So one I mentioned is this vocabulary for quality of service. Um, this is uh, yeah, a summary table. Um, I think it goes a bit into too much detail if I now explain all these vocabularies. Uh, this is something that I would love to follow up with uh, some experts on the one hand side in the uh, semantic modeling area. Uh, on the other hand, um, also with people who do quality of service for other uh, projects uh, or technologies. So not only TSN, but there could be other mechanisms um, and if these actually apply also to these, these other technologies. Good. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the other concept is basically that you also have to annotate things with uh, capability terms. So for, as I already mentioned, like min cycle, how, how fast uh, can it process data? Um, how, uh, what is the minimum cycle, uh, sorry, the maximum cycle to, to receive that? Um, another aspect is, for instance, a working clock. If uh, devices can actually synchronize to a clock, um, there's uh, this uh, precision time protocol, for instance, or some profiles. And uh, we also need to learn uh, within the forms how big are actually the messages in bytes uh, so that we can calculate schedules. And next slide, please. Um, this is kind of a summary uh, where this vocabulary applies. So uh, starting from the left, um, you have to describe uh, the application requirements. So this is uh, actually some internal data that is included in the application code. So for traffic class, it knows um, 
kind of uh, how what is the priority? Is it like isochronous real time? Is it only soft uh, periodic or is it best effort? Uh, it knows um, cycle times, meaning, for instance, with what frequency the control loop has to be run. And uh, then some other more details, like if it's a uh, isochronous um, or deadline traffic class, uh, when is this deadline within the application cycle? And also what kind of loss is allowed? And uh, it also, when it knows uh, which devices to communicate with, it has to basically uh, assign some unique names that uh, can then be used uh, by the scheduler app. So in the second row, um, that is basically vocabulary that is, uh, is used to annotate a scheduler action. And uh, this is then basically um, annotating the input data schema of this action. So um, this is based on, on the scheduler that we have, what information it needs, and uh, basically filled out um, by the other three. So the controller app uh, knows some of these parts. Um, the thing knows some parts, as I mentioned, uh, the capabilities. And uh, lastly, the form also has to provide some uh, more details, uh, like the, the byte sizes that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, we also need the information like uh, listener and talker, which is then a MAC address actually that is required uh, to do so. Um, it can be a unicast uh, interface address or a multicast MAC address, uh, but it's also required uh, for this uh, layer two technology to provide the schedule. Good, uh, just a quick check, uh, audio is still working. Sometimes I add this that I'm talking, nobody's there. Okay. Okay. Well, it says eight here, but uh, then next slide, please. Yet again. So uh, this is about the mappings that we did. So for OPC UA, I mentioned already, um, it's uh, quite straightforward uh, with these nodes mapping to resources. So we could easily um, fit in into the property actions and events. Uh, next key, please. Uh, for the data schema, here the issue was mainly the binary data types. So the JSON schema is not sufficient to describe to the binding or actually the, the content uh, service um, how to encode and how to parse this information. So we had to add uh, an additional annotation here. Um, for the form uh, URI that you need, um, I mean, it's a protocol, so it has to be identified with a URI scheme. Um, here, we propose to reuse the existing opc.tcp scheme, which unfortunately is not registered with IANA, but uh, already used in deployments, um, but uh, combine it with some information at the later part uh, that gives the uh, node IDs and so on to have a, a final addressing of which node you want to talk to. And we stuck to the notation with the semicolon that is already used in all the OPC UA tooling instead of uh, converting this to something HTTP located um, because it's uh, yeah its own scheme, so it can define the, the mechanism behind it. And we stuck with what is already familiar to these, uh, OPC people. Um, content type, you need some. Um, there's nothing registered, so at the moment uh, we are basically working with an experimental one, but it would basically describe this UA binary encoding and uh, yeah, can then call the, the right content service to, to parse this to the JSON used by what applications. Next slide, please. For the netconf binding, um, to make it quick, um, luckily there is restconf, which already defines a lot of things and eased um, basically to have uh, netconf be compatible with the restful approach we find in the web of things. Uh, Two takeaways, maybe. So one for the data schema, you encounter the issue with XML-based features. So if you have these XML node attributes um, that are not supported by JSON, we somehow need the mechanism to express them in uh, the JSON schema-based data schema. And uh, we did this through additional annotations that you basically use a complex structure and you say some of these fields are actually attributes for this object. And uh, so the containing node and not uh, child nodes or um, members in JSON terms. And uh, for the URI, we could almost uh, take it directly. 
Um, however, there are still some more features in, in uh, NetConf, like the data store. So we have a proposal to include this in the uh, UI scheme semantics that uh, basically the first uh, path segment is uh, the data store that is selected um, for, for the uh, write or read what you want to perform. Content type straightforward. Uh, we can use this XML type uh, from the rest conf. That was nice. Next slide, please. These are some examples. Um, they need uh, details, so and I don't have the time. So please have a look uh, offline to this. And uh, on the next slide or slides, I want to conclude. Um, I don't have uh, nice pictures because our lab was in lockdown. However, on the next slide, I have a nice video that hopefully works. Frame rate is not well, but here you see our test bed that we built. Um, so it uses uh, real equipment like this uh, Beckhoff uh, XDS uh, transport system and the uh, universal robots uh, robot. And it's basically these uh, levers that you see uh, in the center top, you see a small bolt that is controlled that basically only flips the blue bonds, and uh, then we can tell the robot to flip back up the, the blue bonds, and this is running uh, through this uh, TSN network, and it's controlled with a supervisory logic based on uh, Node.js and the Node.bot project, and uh, overall uses these uh, thing descriptions and so on for the configuration. Good. Uh, last slide. Uh, sorry, quick question. Are yeah. there AI components of this? Like, Sorry, Ian? Are there any computer vision services or AI components of, of this implementation? Um, there, there is no UI for, for the supervisory logic. Uh, there are some other things that are included, but uh, not, um, yeah, they, they are separate technology for different purposes, like a digital twin or something like this. Okay. Uh, I guess we're looking at uh, edge computing and, and AI offload uh, in Web of Things, and some of that may be applicable to some of these use cases. But. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this supervisory logic is uh, basically running on an edge node. Um, so so underneath there, there are these uh, racks, and there's a server in there that is connected to the TSN network, and through that, um, yeah, can communicate then with the devices. Um, we have open sourced the code for this, and uh, the first version or like the, the early prototype is already merged. Um, there's some uh, polishing work uh, that we did uh, while writing the paper. Um, this update is still pending, but hopefully, um, yeah, uh, contributed soon. Um, I guess the biggest caveat is that uh, this TSN scheduler app is not included. Um, that's because it's uh, internal proprietary work. Um, however, there's interestingly an open source scheduler, which could be a good starting point for some future work to, to make this kind of scenario um, yeah, more accessible for the research community and the bot community. And yeah, for details, stay tuned for the paper uh, should be published uh, in September. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthias. I think we actually do have uh, time for, for a question. So any anybody else who has a question about this? So I guess what's the roadmap for standardization here? Um, do, you, do you have uh, expectation of proposing something within IETF or W3C or what? Um, so there is this open GitHub issue um, where you ask what protocols, uh, what protocol bindings to go next. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually planning to to uh, put a preprint on uh, this this archive uh, website and and uh, okay. submit it there, and then through through this activity uh, continue there. Um, okay. Currently, I'm not pushing this toward IEEE or these these uh, folks uh, because they're more conservative and currently are fully yeah busy with with their own extensions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll off. see. I guess the what protocol bindings is the next step. Then. Exactly. So especially, I think there was some more interest in uh, OPC UA. Um, one limitation that I mentioned, or sorry, it's only on the slides. Um, we started out with the client server architecture at the moment um, because the node uh, 
OPC UA implementation that we use doesn't support PubSub yet. Um, I'm working with a C implementation of this. Um, so we have to see if uh, we can get the PubSub working somehow in a uh, right. uh, bot stack. I think another orth orthogonal issue here is the data modeling problems that you ran into. Um, it seems like, you know, uh, we should revisit uh, and push harder on JSON schema and its uh, improvements or, uh, to deal with these issues officially in an official way. Yeah, if you have um, like a, a maintenance uh, threat or something for, for the data schema, um, if you could point me to this, then I could uh, at least um, like these, these issues with the XML binding, I think, are very generic and, and would be good to solve. Yeah, it's been my to-do list forever, and we need to pull in uh, uh, Henry Andrews and, and have a, a conversation. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Matthias. That was very interesting. <clears throat> that that was our first uh, research uh, segment, and uh, now I would like to to start the industry updates uh, segment and of course the the question is uh, this is a research group so wh why do we have uh, industry updates and uh, the, the observation of course is that in the iot space uh, you can invent a lot of things but if it doesn't make uh, make it into uh, industry products and and uh, industry standards uh, it, it's going to be less useful um, so um, there are lots of, of SDOs out there that do interesting things, but uh, their communication often is uh, oriented at decision makers and, and cannot be understood by engineers. Um, so uh, hidden behind the, the, the press releases, <clears throat> there may be some interesting technical innovations and, and uh, we, we're trying to uncover them and in particular, uncover the research questions that really came up here. And I think we, we just did this in, in, in uh, Matthias' uh, presentation because uh, what he did, uh, again, has an impact on, on uh, how we work with data models. So, so that's a typical thing that, that's uh, happening. So uh, we, we are planning to have uh, short segments about industry updates in, in all future uh, summary meetings this time it, it's kind of trying to to cover the whole uh, space uh, which is why we we have uh, so many uh, of uh, those uh, maybe next time it will be more more uh, focused on on some specific uh, items so this is my intro to this and the first industry update we seem to have a shortage of michaels today only have two, we usually have three. So Michael Richardson was supposed to present this. So maybe we can just go to the next Michael. Michael Costa, can you do the? <clears throat> sure, sure, I'm here. This, this, um, yeah, I'm ready. So um, yeah, advanced slide, please. Great. So um, really, I have updates on a couple of uh, activities. The one that maybe not be so familiar with the details would be Project CHIP, Connected Home over IP in the Zigbee Alliance. And um, just to, to summarize that, I don't really have a lot of detail, but I, I, I can take a few questions. Uh, basically, the players in Smart Home, the commercial players in Smart Home all got together and um, kind of took over the Zigbee Alliance, if you will, to create this uh, project chip specification. And the idea is to bring uh, IP protocol uh, networks to smart homes. So it's focused on delivering uh, smart home connectivity over Wi-Fi thread and uh, an IP over BLE systems, since a lot of these devices have BLE. Uh, we add that as a, as a transport. So. Um, Basically, though, this is basically a, uh, the, the push to, for common IP connectivity on, on smart homes. Uh, I, I guess the I probably should have thought about a little more technical detail, but it's, it's not really there isn't really a, a good architecture spec. It's be, really being done uh, with a sort of a code first uh, design document based uh, approach. 
So there's an open source um, design. There's a basically an open source repo that you can go to and look at and see everything that's been contributed by the different companies. Uh, Lower code has been contributed by Silicon Labs since the uh, since the the data model part, the part that we're interested in, is basically going to follow the Zigbee data model. So essentially, there are a couple of ways that Zigbee is opening up their data model. One is through this chip project and the open sourcing of this, the embedded stack that processes the, the data model elements in the meta model and the the data models themselves the uh, cluster library is it called the zigbee cluster library is now published as open source using the bsd3 clause license so all of the it's, it's an xml format right now but uh, um there, there are basically, uh, as you'll hear later, uh, ways of uh, translating that that we're working on. So um, Project Chip is being contributed to by all of these companies and many, many companies, actually many vendors, I, too many to even list. There are about 200 companies uh, signed up, 20 or 30 really strong contributors. Um, they have a simple demo that, that just became operational, which is basically a little hello world, a little echo. I think you can turn a light on and off, basically, or a simulated light on and off with a light switch. So it's sort of a, a proximal network demo of switch connecting to a light. I didn't really get into it, but I said interoperability over IP networks. Um, it sort of focuses on being able to have a smart home with proximal network and devices directly interacting with maybe hubs where applications, more complex applications run, but also um, the internet at large. It isn't really restricted to just the the, the smart home, but with, it's, it really is, and I didn't really make a big point of this, but the last bullet, it's about certifying devices. So it's not it's not really about network uh, standards, the way we think about them in IETF. This is about um, being able to run a bunch of certification tests and qualify a device for, uh, for conformance and for interoperability. So in addition to the, the historical Zigbee mission, mission of device conformance and more of a business focused. This this project chip is definitely more customer focused and focused on delivering interoperable devices. So that the, the whole stack, it's a whole stack approach, but using, uh, you know, pieces from um, well, wherever we can get them. We're currently debating uh, incorporation of CBOR as the, uh, as the wire format for data as opposed to uh, PLVs, and so we're doing a, a little bit of a trade-off uh, around that question right now, for example. All right, um, so any questions, comments? Oh, okay, either it's not that interesting or I did a good job of summarizing. Let's go on to the uh, um, one data model. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, one data model <clears throat> also came out of Zigbee, strangely enough, in the fall of 2018, Zigbee brought together a, a, a bunch of other SDOs of like OCF and ONA and folks from Bluetooth and um, um, one, um, one M2M as well. I think we need to re-engage with one M2M because the Huawei connection has sort of pulled them away from a lot of the work we're doing, but now we we, we can do, we can get back in business with them. So one M to M and some of these other associations, they, they got together and, and sort of listed their top issues and really lack of a common data model was really something that everyone said was holding things back. So uh, one data model was sort of started as a, an industry liaison group, all these STOs and vendors and some invited experts to um, to look at this problem. And originally, I think it was thought that Zigbee Zigbee had a data model and OCF had a data model, meaning that there were already a bunch of definitions for things like thermostats and lights and switches and door locks, and that that maybe people could just adopt one of those. But that um, that didn't happen. There wasn't any any one of these models that really anyone else wanted to adopt. They're all very very close held to their organizations, and some of them are more general than others, but they didn't really have the use case coverage. So what um, what the group decided to do was go off and create a, a common language and a common meta model first that can express all of the these other IoT data models. 
as a way of, um, of basically ultimately driving convergence from diverse models. So rather than just down selecting on one model that already existed and building on that, uh, this became an effort of, of, of converging uh, across across industry, really, even including some of these energy and microgrid verticals like SunSpec that uh, currently has a Modbus model, a mod, bunch of Modbus register definitions for you know, solar inverters and stuff that they want to use one day model as well. So um, we have a language. And basically, it's based on defining common classes of affordance that allow you to build semantic type definitions on top of that. And it's aligned with the Web of Things model in this uh, respect, the thing description model. It's aligned with the work we're doing in IoT schema. And um, it's also, um, earlier Karsten mentioned this sort of uh, cross 14 <laughs> different uh, standards and how they all model things and and there's a sort of a common alignment that we're uh, taking advantage there in one data model that, that use these common classes of affordances so we're not really modeling internal behaviors and 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 all of that we're really starting to focus on these common classes of affordances how do you turn the light on and off and how do you dim it and how do you find out what the temperature is and what are all the semantic types of data so it's about interoperability but at at the at a more abstract level uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so where we are with that is we've, our, our phase one was just nominally complete, but the language will of course always evolve, but we have a language that we think is stable enough to, um, to be able to uh, create a bunch of models and we've indeed done that. We have about 200 model definitions, mostly from OMA and uh, OCF but also a few examples from Zigbee and Bluetooth Mesh and uh, more examples coming uh, along the way for things like uh, field buses and uh, the SunSpec stuff and OPC UA hopefully and things like that. Um, one of the things we did accomplish, and I said that originally these folks all got together under liaison agreement because they, they're used to uh, working in a patent pool type arrangement where they, they Kind of share intellectual property but what we quickly realized is we didn't want to have these data models carry uh, any intellectual property with them they're generally they're just data models so uh, we basically got all of the organizations to agree to publish their data models um, at least using the sdf format the one data model um, language format uh, under the bsd3 clause open source license so phase two <clears throat> pardon me, where we're, we're looking at data model consolidation and organizations coming and publishing their models and getting the interaction going to, to sort of uh, create some common, uh, common basis for modeling. Um, and again, this is diverse transfer layer protocols. So, so we're, we're really working at the layer above transfer layers. We need protocol bindings, but we're not, that's out of scope. But we're working on consolidating just these, these models. So since everyone's agreed to publish under BSD3 clause, we're going to open up the group to a broader participation based on an open source contribution model as opposed to a liaison model. We'll probably keep the liaison for a, a core group of people to be able to maybe do some, some long-term planning and governance and stuff, but uh, that we're not going to operate under a, a, any kind of a, a closed IP anymore. It's all going to be just a BSD3 clause. So we built public facing website and content and we're, we're, uh, we're basically um, open for business, if you will. We, we want to, uh, we don't really have all of our procedures and policies in place, but we do want to get people to start come help, help us with the next development of the language, uh, bring more use cases, bring more models. Um, that's basically where we are right now. That's what I have for for one DM questions, comments. Oh, again, good. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Michael, hmm. uh, I had a question for the previous one. This uh, project uh, home over IP. Yes. I wasn't sure if I missed uh, like a preceding slide. Is is there a proper name or some some what? <laughs> Okay, so project, yeah, the, the, the proper name, that's an interesting question. We're calling it Project CHIP, C-H-I-P, 
uh, connect okay. home over IP, but that's just a working project name. There, there is going to be an actual trademark uh, name for the protocol um, that's going to be the brand name. So Chip isn't the brand name; it's just the working project name. But, okay. Uh, so Huawei, also Huawei is now a member of Zigbee, and Huawei is now involved in Project Chip. So your colleagues may be able to uh, share more information. Okay, so but there's no uh, uh, landing page yet or something like this. Uh, there, well, there's a there's a little bit, but it's the open source repo. This mm -hmm. is really an okay. open source project, and if you really want to know how it's going, you can the, the the start here is pretty much the the repository. I can I can send you some pointers as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I think we will uh, return to 1DM when I talk about the SDF uh, buff. So maybe we can have more questions that uh, come up uh, there. So project chip is certainly interesting and we will need to track what, what's going on uh, in there. <clears throat> so the next uh, thing on the agenda is OMA Specworks. Travis, are you there? I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, I wanted just to give you guys an update on, on a couple of working groups we have uh, in OMA. Um, the uh, Device Management Service Enablement Group, um, which is basically the lightweight m to m stuff, and then the uh, IFSO IP Smart Objects update. So, next slide. So, we're uh, about to release the version 1.2. We're just now finishing up some consistency reviews. So you should be seeing a release uh, from us here shortly uh, this summer. Just wanted to highlight some of the updates that we have in this new release. Um, if you're familiar with Lightweight M2M, it, it operates at the application layer of the stack. Uh, in previous versions, it was a co-app UDP, uh, had some LoRa involved in 1.1, in um, but it was, you know, pretty much had a, a prescriptive stack. Um, what we're now allowing in 1.2 is uh, be becoming more transport agnostic um, with the messaging layer of uh, MQTT and, and HTTP. Uh, there's different use cases that, you know, some more cloud-friendly services that we've, we've found that uh, this enabled uh, that capability. Uh, there's some optimizations in 1.2 of uh, optimizing, you know, how much data is, is Put over the wire uh, for bootstrapping and registration, uh, op, you know, reducing the amount of data needed, um, as well as uh, in our information reporting inter interface. Um, we've now optimized how the, how that operation works. Um, one feature we're, we're really excited about is our lightweight and gateway capability. For those in the industry, there's a lot of brownfield devices out there uh, that may or may not have a, a device, you know, a consistent device management uh, protocol. Um, and so what the gateway allows us to do is, is start to manage multiple devices uh, in those brownfield scenarios with a common uh, protocol at the gateway level back to, to whatever your service, services side is. Uh, we're also uh, going to be publishing a new uh, encoding format uh, that we call lightweight M2M Seaboard. Uh, it's, it, it will be uh, published as part of the 1.2 release. You can see how the optimizations that we are, are doing for, for that one. Um, next slide. Oops. Okay, uh, just some more updates here. We have uh, new notification updates, um, uh, attributes um, available. We're, we did a lot of work on the security layer uh, with TLS, DTLS 1.3, uh, giving a lot of flexibility by uh, separating this out um, and making it a configurable uh, information piece um, and, and untangling um, the uh, the way that we, we handle security credentials uh, with the server. Um, we uh, are also getting a little bit more, you know, as we grow, uh, we have to like figure out how we're doing versioning. Um, so we are getting more clear about that uh, with our lightweight and M objects. Um, that also goes hand in hand with how IPSO is doing the same thing. 
with their versioning, um, as, as well as we we publish some uh, additional functionality for for how to uh, how to do firmware updates. Next slide. Uh, so Lei Shan and, and Wakama are kind of our uh, the Eclipse IoT uh, groups uh, reference open source implementations. Um, so if you guys want to go check it out, it's an uh, easy way to uh, to uh, see how this works and, and get your hands on uh, with, with what's out there. Next slide. Uh, so this is on the IPSO side of things. So here you can see the stack. Um, where IPSO fits is at the data model layer. Um, I pre appreciate the 1DM uh, update that we just had. Uh, the IPSO group is uh, working with the liaison group there um, and has uh, contributed all the IPSO objects that we have to the uh, 1DM playground uh, as well. You can go to the next slide. So just real quick, just the understand the IPSO object structure, it's basically an object, an instance, uh, and the object is made up of resources. Um, and we have a, a, a format, URI format here, that we can have extensible objects, objects can be composite objects. Uh, if you guys are familiar with this structure, maybe. I can go to the next slide. So here's uh, a number of objects that are made up of uh, resources that are uh, some examples, um, or they're, they are published and uh, shared with 1DM. Um, and we have object IDs for these uh, for these objects. If you go to the next slide, you'll see those objects are made up of reusable resources. So this is at the lower sensor level or individual uh, resource. Uh, level and so really encouraging the uh, object definitions to use these reusable resources and we you know want to grow this where, where possible um, but leveraging a lot of the stuff that we have in uh, 1dm uh, cinml um, uh, definitions for these resources you know ipso's point of view is we want to create ipso IP smart objects that can work with uh, our lightweight into m objects uh, management, but we really want to follow whatever uh, the broader industry adoption standards are. You know, I think this 1DM effort is is really interesting to us. Uh, we don't uh, want to be, you know, de declaring a particular way to do this. We want to to find the broader consensus, and that's kind of our approach to this. Next slide. So. Uh, we have uh, published some tools from the group. Uh, so there's some uh, open source uh, projects and scripts uh, to uh, get your hands on what it means to create and validate an IPSO smart object. Um, so whether you're working in C, JavaScript, um, or there's an interesting one with uh, BIPSO for BLE characteristics. Um, but here's just, you know, for your reference. Uh, a way to look at the, the IPSO registry as well as is the scripts to uh, interact and, and, and publish your own uh, objects here. So that's all I have. Uh, any questions for us? So those links on the slides can, can all be followed so we can see where BIPSO is done and so on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have a little time for questions. Okay, I think the, the fun part will be to see how this all then comes together in, in the 1DM uh, context. Uh, so I'm looking forward uh, to that. But we already have uh, 100 or so uh, IPSO models in the 1DM playground. So uh, much of the work has already been uh, done, which is encouraging.
it's worth pointing out that there are open source tools now that automatically convert between the Ipso XML and SDF and back and forth, and also the uh, OMA models that more or less automate the conversion. Maybe you're going to talk about that in the SDF part, but I thought it'd be a good point to, to point that out. Okay, yep, thank you. Point. So um, I'm looking for Wouter, who doesn't seem to have himself free from his previous meeting yet. Wouter is sharing a meeting, or has been sharing a meeting in the previous hour, so uh, it's sometimes hard to get rid of that. Um, so I think we're going to, to skip uh, this part here and go right to the um, W3C uh, segment, uh, which I don't have slides for. Michael, how do you want to do that? Uh, yes. So if you look in the minutes, uh, you'll see that basically I've linked to the face to face slides. I'm just going to share my screen if it's okay. Um, and uh, so hopefully you can see now my uh, slides. Let's go full screen here. So uh, now I put a link to this repo um, into the minutes, and I also link to some particular uh, slides. So I think that of interest to this group is probably uh, uh, the uh, topics on security, um, discovery, and probably a life cycle in particular, but also I think uh, profiles and um, uh, of course, thing description are likely to be of interest. Now we've already discussed discovery, I think at great length in previous meetings. So I don't think I want to dive do a deep dive into that. Um, I think I would like to start though by just talking about the plug fest, which has a, a summary deck here. So actually the meeting was two weeks long. We had a one week plug fest and we had a uh, a one week face to face and the, the virtual face to face was 15 hours of total uh, minutes uh, or hours uh, in meetings, which corresponds to a two and a half day face to face, basically. So it's the same length of time as far as total meetings. Now, the plug fest was also uh, rather than being a weekend, it took place over an entire week and we just synchronized you know, one hour a day um, because of time zone changes. Uh, but we also had a virtual uh, VPN set up uh, to share a, kind of a virtual network. Now, I will say that um, I think we didn't get well organized enough in advance of the face to face uh, of the plug fest rather. And so we only got the VPN really functional like on Wednesday of the week. So we didn't accomplish much as I would have hoped, but I think that uh, we did kind of figure out how to do the VPN and in particular how to do a VPN bridge. So as Michael Coster mentioned before, uh, we, we had a setup for Raspberry Pi where the Raspberry Pi could then act as a bridge to the VPN network then other devices could connect uh, over a Wi-Fi access point or over a wired network. I had not really know about the VPN at all. They would just connect to a, a network. The network had a DHP server and a NAT and so forth, uh, but running in the cloud. And you could also do broadcast packets. So things like, for example, MDNS would work. Um, so we uh, we got that working. And I just want to kind of summarize, you know, we got this uh, here down down here below, you can see my little uh, Raspberry Pi going through a, a secondary network interface into a Wi-Fi access point, and it could uh, also have a second upstream interface that it talked to, uh, you know, the my local network. Um, and so that was all working. Um, it's not 100% reliable, and so I think we need to, you know, get uh, improvements here. I, like I said, I wanted to coordinate with IETF Hackathon because I think something similar would be very useful for the IETF Hackathon. Um, and this is just a summary of the various devices that we had running. Um, so on the VPN, you know, we had, uh, you know, a set of people uh, from different companies, uh, some in Japan, um, some in Europe, some in, uh, in Canada, some in uh, various places. And, and there was a, a, a NAT running the cloud that also provided uh, uh, internet access. And then there were various other services that had their own uh, 
uh, internet, uh, full internet interfaces. Um, the other project we had running um, was uh, Fraunhofer had an implementation of a directory service. And Fraunhofer has been very active, and I think we'll, uh, and the uh, uh, person involved in Fraunhofer is going to be uh, uh, also on the editor, editor's list for the uh, Watt Discovery uh, standard, which is in, uh, in progress. And uh, so anyways, we had this prototype and we had it running, actually we had it both locally uh, behind the NAT and also as a network interface. And one of the things we're kind of looking at is kind of how to federate multiple you know, directory services. But uh, we had uh, you know, uh, TDs for devices getting registered uh, with this. Um, it was a bit of a hack because basically we had a script that just pulled TDs out of the Git GitHub repo where we had them archived. But I think eventually we need to figure out a way to uh, discover devices and have them register against the directory service. It wasn't quite done yet. So we faked it by pulling things from the GitHub archive. Um, and then uh, and then the uh, DNS SD was being used by this directory service to provide kind of an introduction service to be able to find the, uh, the directory in the first place. Um, and I think so. sorry, question. I think it's also a little bit of an implementation issue. But I think these are the... Yeah, so to, to recap. I talked about for uh, discovery, the idea is to have a two phase process where it's first an introduction mechanism that finds a directory, and then there's be a, a standardized directory service, the standardized API. And so DNS SD is just one possible way to do the introduction service. It could be, you could even just give it a URL. Um, that's the bit most basic uh, introduction mechanism. At any rate, we. Um, uh, we do have to solve the how to populate the directory service um, problem. We can register things against the directory, but then you still have to, you know, uh, figure out how to do registrations. And so you might need a separate service that is a discoverer that finds devices and then takes on the task of doing the registrations on the behalf of devices that don't do it themselves. So that's still under discussion. And the other project we did was auto population of a node red. So there's another project um, done by um, Itachi, um, and they had a, a node red uh, interface. And so what we did is uh, we uh, had a script that could pull uh, information out of the directory and could auto generate node red nodes. Uh, so you could have a use case where someone uh, could just pull up node red have all the, the devices you know, magically appear in the dashboard for node red, and then you could drag and drop to build IoT orchestrations. And the idea is the directory would, could keep track of the various devices and let you search for things you wanted, and then you yeah, can exactly. automatically generate things. Yeah. Um, there's also some testing tools we looked at. Um, uh, Technical University of Munich has a testing tool where they were reading things uh, reading TDs and then generating basically fuzz testing of devices. So you could automatically, you know, poke at devices and make sure they're, they're operational and uh, maybe identify security hazards and so forth. There also is this ongoing work about hypermedia. Um, and so basically the problem is that, you know, how do we deal with things that dynamically created resources in, in like, an, like a, so there's both things like ongoing actions and events, subscriptions, but there are other kinds of created resources you might want to have. And so the question is, do those resources go into the TD, which will require the TD to constantly be changing? Or do we have some other mechanism to statically declare, like a, say a, URI a URI template uh, that would indicate the format of a dynamic resource but would not have each individual resource? The problem is that dynamic TDs cause all kinds of complications for directories because then you have to like invalidate caches and things like this. Um, it also is a potential privacy concern because you don't want other people to know about resources they didn't create. Um, and so we are currently, uh, what's that? The thing Sorry, Voter needs to mute. Yeah, if there's a question, please state it clearly and I can answer it uh, yeah. otherwise. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I, I pointed at a link earlier. Need something on screen because I have to do another Revex in two minutes. Uh, so. Oh, um, what I will say in the earlier section uh, about the um, Web of Things at the beginning of this meeting, I had a link to the current main issue discussing this whole um, TDs versus um, dynamic versus static TDs. And it is uh, a tricky issue. And there's kind of this, what is the boundary between data and metadata? And the idea of dynamic resources is kind of one of those boundary cases. So we have to make a decision about, you know, uh, how static are TDs. There are certainly cases that need to be updated. So one thing we're looking at, for example, is rotating IDs to disable to uh, to break tracking algorithms, and that would require some kind of way for directories to notify people that a TT's changed. Okay, so that's that was the plug fest, and we we had some interesting work going on, and so we we did a bunch of issues, and we um, we uh, put those into the testing repo, and we 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 are tracking them. So, in particular, some things of relevance here are we found out that the implementations of JSON path were not really consistent. In particular, the version we were using of JSON path didn't allow recursive searches, which we actually needed for discovery for like listing TDs. So we had to use XPath uh, because uh, it doesn't wasn't that it doesn't exist in JSON path? It's that the implementation didn't have it. So there's a problem with not knowing, you know, not having a complete spec for the for the uh, for the standard means it's hard to know when an implementation, you know, is completely doing things. We also have an issue with IDs. IDs are optional in TDs, but they're often used as primary keys in databases, and so you have to generate a local key. You can't use the ID field in a TD as your primary key in a database because it may not exist. Um, and so that was another issue that came up. So still like this. Um, I think also of relevance, you know, is we need to look at uh, introduction mechanisms that don't have typed links. So there actually are introduction mechanisms that only have a URL. And so we have to know, does that point at a directory or directly at a device? And we have to figure that out kind of dynamically, kind of without having uh, the help of a type. Okay, so that was the plug fest. And um, I think, um, like I said, other things of relevance are um, security. There's actually one point here I want to bring up. Uh, so I basically brought up some things that were uh, critical for security. So one is uh, we're planning to do, or uh, uh, we're planning to at least propose uh, having the ability to sign TDs. So we want to be able to have basically a proof section based on JSON LD uh, proofs that would allow us to uh, maintain the integrity of TDs. And actually, DIDs can also have encrypted IDs that uh, do like a hash of the of the content, so you can avoid having to change things. This is implications for whether or not uh, TDs can be updated, because if we hash the content of a TD. And then we update it, then it changes the ID. Um, and, uh, and if we sign TDs, uh, there's actually a mechanism for doing proof chaining that we'd have to use there. But it's basically signing TDs is basically a, a you know a blockchain type idea. So uh, we do want to have some way though of of locking down the content of TDs. Um, the other big topic has been OAuth two. Um, and we very recently posted a update to TDs. So right now the spec only has the code flow, but it turns out OAuth two actually requires you know man, human inter, uh, interaction for granting and authorizations and so forth. And so there are cases where you don't want to do that. Um, and there's also an IETF spec for a device flow, which is kind of designed for IoT devices. There's also two uh, uh, OAuth flows that have been deprecated, um, and so we didn't want to necessarily we had a discussion about whether we included that in the TD spec or not. What's currently on the table is we will not include by default the deprecated flows, implicit and password. We will include core, client, and device. 
and device being the kind of new one. You can still use the old deprecated flows if you really have to, um, but you have to include an extension vocabulary to do so. So that's the current, and that's not uh, that released, but it is on the table for being included in probably 1.1 as a backward compatible extension. Um, let's see. Um, I think that lifecycle we've also discussed in the workshop, so I won't dive into that, but there was some small updates. Uh, profiles, we're having an ongoing discussion about, you know, how to get interoperability and basically having a discussion about what a profile should include. And there's also a whole lot of work going on around use cases. Um, and we actually had, I can bring this up actually, this is useful. We had a, so Michael Galley from Oracle has been working on uh, sorting use cases by priority and who's working on them. And so we had a survey uh, and he has more updated versions of this. Yeah, so trying to prioritize the various use cases. And so just based on the number of respondents that said it was critical or business relevant, um, it looks like, you know, smart city manufacturing, uh, energy and smart building come out on top. However, um, I think there's also things like uh, retail and uh, agriculture that are also pretty, uh, well, okay. Retail is one that's, that's close to the top. And uh, so anyways, uh, this is a, a sort of discussion we're having. Uh, the other thing worth saying is that some of these use cases are vertical like agriculture and some are horizontal like uh, uh, accessibility, okay? So we're, I think we need to kind of divide these up into horizontal and vertical. And also there's requirements uh, that we need to extract from these use cases. And there's also some things in flight. Um, there's uh, some more agricultural things coming on, on online. Um, there is uh, some stuff on edge computing that is uh, in, in flight. And there's some smart city related stuff and retail related stuff that's in flight. Um, and then there's these horizontal ones. Okay, so that's use cases. Um, and I think, you know, thing description uh, had some updates as well. And, you know, this is mostly, uh, these slides mostly go through. So right now we're basically in cleanup phase, uh, trying to clean up uh, some issues uh, that are ambiguous or confusing or underspecified and get to 1.1. I think one discussion there is we do, or someone has wind chimes going. Really well, actually, that that are cowbells, and uh, that's my time. Okay. When we are at the end of the time allocation for a slot. Okay, I'm done then. That's that. That's all I wanted to stop. So, great. So we we have the the pointer to that presentation in the uh, notes. I hope. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, so I have pointers to the entire repo, and then I have points to some particular ones that I looked at. Um, and, uh, but uh, yeah, so just follow up and you can see all the details as, as you wish. Okay. Thank you. Any quick questions before we go to the next item? Okay, Wouter, can you present your slides? Uh, yes, I can. Please do, because my computer is slow for that. Now we see a black, ah. It's slow. Hey, it has to go through probably the US and then back. So uh, happy to present something that happened in OCF. So uh, I did not use the whole all spanning in what OCF means. Uh, uh, and that is very, very recently, because it's uh, only uh, something like a week ago, that we released a new version called 2.2.0. And uh, what is very new uh, is that we now have an 
uh, a spec called OCF Cloud API for Cloud Services. What does that do? Well, uh, if you see a little bit to the right, the diagram, uh, if you're talking about IoT, um, you're talking about things like device-to-device -device communication. That was already there from the beginning. Then we started to talk about bridging. Um, um, so basically uh, that you have other devices, other ecosystems where you can talk to. So we have a complete bridging architecture. Then of course you have the uh, use cases that you have a smartphone uh, IP connected and you want to talk to your home. And so you want to do something with remote access through a cloud service. So then uh, cloud technology is born. And uh, then certainly you have another issue that if you have a device connected to a specific, specific cloud and you have another device that is connected to an other cloud that you want to aggregate them uh, from user perspective. So that's where the cloud to cloud stuff comes into. Um, the basic thing, and I think it's also a very nice integration layer that can be used going forward, but uh, that's something for the future. Um, basically, if you have a, a, an account in the cloud by means of an uh, OAuth server, so you have a, us a user account there, and you have another cloud um, with another user ID, you, we use uh, standard technologies to do that um, matching up. And then of course, all the uh, OCF uh, devices, device listings, you need to communicate that uh, between those clouds so that you can synchronize the view on both sides with devices and clients you have. So that was uh, a decent amount of work uh, to get done and everything is there. Uh, open source is there as well. So I think this is a huge step forward for cloud integrations as well. Um, so it's really making things easier for ourselves. Um, to underpin all this work, and that's why most of this stuff is uh, hard to do, um, we have a running, code running on the device uh, in IoTivity. Um, Probably most of the people know that already, that uh, that uh, code base is available, open source, Apache 2 license, so what's not to like. Um, but uh, the cloud stuff is, well, it's, it doesn't have to be uh, targeted to, to a small device, a small CPU, uh, and crunching uh, the, the, uh, the size to fit on, on small CPUs. Uh, cloud stuff is really, really different. So you really want to make it scalable, having that uh, done in, in uh, different technologies. So that's why we have a different code base there and it's based on Go and it's a, well, we, know, we call it Go OCF. And uh, there is one repo that has uh, quite a lot of uh, Docker containers already completely configured. And there is also an experimental um, um instance of the cloud and cloud to cloud technology there already so it's already available that you can play with it so this well together with the spec work spec works that we did um uh, and getting this done that was a uh, the major work that we did uh, in the last year is a directional change that is nice to mention is that um uh, previously, we, uh, well, something like a year ago, two years ago, we always talked about OCF as a complete uh, and uh, complete stack, uh, full full stack, including data models. But we got some uh, indications by uh, other vendors, but also from other organizations that what we are doing uh, as a framework is pretty nice. Um, uh, so what we did as a directional change is that you can also use uh, what we call now the OCF core framework um, as a complete stack, and you can just build your own app, and your own your own protocols on top of it. And what this gives is then uh, that you can use a standardized uh, framework, and 
that standardized framework itself is completely secure. It secures all the endpoints of your application. And that's uh, uh, hopefully a step forward to the market um, because there are quite a lot of uh, IP projects that, uh, well, don't want to use a standard, but use uh, needs to be secure. And we try to, uh, to enable this kind of work of, by, by having this OCF core framework, we would like to enable uh, those kind of possibilities for non-standardized uh, ecosystems or ecosystems that want to move to IP. Uh, it's what you want to do with it, um, what makes sense. And this is all across um, uh, all the models, uh, the, the network configurations that I showed in the first slide. So uh, you can transport your model then on top of uh, the framework um, on the proximal network, but also through uh, through the cloud and cloud to cloud technologies. That all works. I think this is a, also a step forward for the whole industry to get more adoption for IoT. The other thing that we are looking at is uh, the security. Uh, we 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 already have. Um, can I have uh, two more minutes? Um, so one of the things that we think is uh, good to have is um, everybody is uh, looking at what is le uh, the legislation governments doing about security. So we already identified five different documents that have security requirements, and we are ranking ourselves against those requirements. And um, well, the luckily, uh, well, it's not luck, of course. Uh, we are trying to match as much of them, the red ones that we think we can meet, but we did not meet them yet. And of course, there are requirements uh, in those documents that are not applicable because they are not about uh, a standard or an ecosystem. They are about uh, vendor kind of technologies. But I think this is also a step forward in. Uh, recognizing that we are looking at what uh, the legislation uh, uh, organizational wise is doing that we are trying to meet their challenges that I see. And the last slide. Uh, so one of the things that we are doing quite a bit is cooperation with other standards. So recently um, IP Bliss has been announced. That is a cooperation between um, BACnet, uh, a threat organization, Zigbee, and KNX, and OCF uh, to move forward uh, in building automation that everybody wants to use IP. So that's a, a huge thing because KNX and BACnet are known to have uh, not yet to be there on IP, so they that they are saying that uh, they want to move to IP is a big thing. Uh, that OCF is there is, is uh, well a minor thing because we are already IP based. Um, so from that perspective, as a directional setting, IP Bliss uh, will do good for IoT as a whole. That everything will move to IP, and of course uh, all the security stuff that I mentioned in the previous slide would come into play. Uh, another thing that uh, we are working heavily on is 1DM. That's a cooperation between, uh, um, was also started out as a liaison between multiple parties, uh, but it's now uh, public. And uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is making sure that data models as a whole are being aligned across, yeah, as many as possible industries. So uh, please take a look at that as well. And that fits into that uh, we have something like the, the core framework um, so that, uh, well, whatever models comes out of this uh, work, you can just transport it over the OCF core framework. And even if you have a different model that's not being accepted, um, then you can also transport it over the core framework. So, thanks for those uh, additional minutes because that was my last slide. Any questions? I would have one, uh, Matthias. This IP bliss uh, is this a, like a continuation of 
uh, fair here or uh, how do these two relate? Uh, no, it's not a continuation of fair hair. Fair hair was a uh, separate organization, uh, but it was very IPR friendly because IPR did not exist there. Uh, IP Bliss is really a liaison between those organizations, and it's uh, we are saying that it's marketing, but of course it will do technical things uh, going forward. It's mainly getting everybody on the network and making sure that uh, the coexistence of those different application protocols will will exist but it's not coexist and it is then leverage each other so that uh, you can use ocf um, together with backnet together with knx uh, what the best uh, way of doing is so one thing that we did in 1dm is looking at the different organizations and where they were good at and basically in IP Bliss, we will do probably the same thing um, in what is good and what is uh, uh, where an organization is good in and use and try to push that and leverage that as much as possible. But it's uh, it's definitely not a continuation of fair hair. Uh, but yeah, the principles that were written down in fair hair uh, probably would apply. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's look at the, the schedule. We, we have pretty much squeezed Michael's presentation about uh, IOTSF out of the agenda Michael, you maybe just want to say one or two sentences while my chrome is starting to share things again uh so i did do a presentation at the iot directorate which is recorded um and uh they are iotsf um is doing a series of training courses which i'm involved in creating and those will get announced probably next week And they also have some work on supply chain security, but it is still very, very young. Thank you. And quick question for Michael. We can link to the uh, IoT Directorate notes in our notes. So if you want to learn more, you can look there. So sorry for, for squeezing you out, Michael. But, uh... I actually screwed up what hour it started. Came an hour late. Yeah. I think we can have a more detailed discussion of LTSF next time we uh, meet. So thank you for that. And uh, let me quickly uh, point to the ASDF buff that is uh, happening at the uh, IETF 108, um, and uh, I think we have talked about 1DA, and uh, the, the the interesting thing from an IETF point of view is that there have been a few people pointing to 1DM uh, repeatedly uh, over time, but because 1DM tried to avoid being that 15th uh, standard and really wanted to operate as a liaison organization. Uh, they haven't uh, done the press releases and all this stuff that that uh, competing organizations usually do. Uh, so th they were essentially running in stealth mode uh, for a year. And uh, now we have a little problem because a lot of people in the ITF uh, don't know about that, at least those people who, who haven't uh, been to uh, research group meetings where we uh, have uh, uh, talked about uh, 1DM. So uh, three days ago, 1DM uh, finally decided to, to actually do the coming out. And uh, there is now a website, 1dm.org, uh, that has a lot of information. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this uh, because uh, 1DM essentially has done three things that, that are of note. 
One is the agreement on a legal model that, that uh, Michael talked about, that uh, everything is done based on BSD3 clause and so on. We are not doing this old IPR heavy uh, way of, of doing things that has already killed other organizations. Um, the second thing is we have a common specification format, and this is really what the buff will be about. And the third thing is we have started to collect a couple hundred contributed data models. Right now there are four SDOs in there. I hope there will be other uh, SDOs um, uh, soon. So we are trying to show that the, the uh, mechanisms uh, actually uh, work. Um, 1DM spent a lot of time about pressure testing the specification, which is really just uh, trying to convert data models uh, into the common format and see whether we can express what we want. Now, SDF has been released as a 1.0, but it's not uh, yet uh, complete. It, it uh, doesn't have all the features. It doesn't have all the, the normative specificity that we want from a standard and so on. So the question is, who actually uh, does the, the work of leading SDF 1.0 forward uh, to, to a, a standard? And that's actually something that, that uh, um, 1DM thinks could be done in the IETF. Uh, so the IETF would define the format, but would uh, not really be, be uh, working a lot on, on doing data models. I mean, I, I don't want to completely exclude that this uh, ever happens, that the IETF thinks it, it's useful to have uh, data models defined in SDF, in particular when it comes to network management, that, that might actually happen. Uh, but um, IETF would then be one of the, the uh, blue boxes down there, blue-green boxes, ecosystem one, ecosystem two, that, that are contributing to the area where 1DM really is about uh, harmonizing uh, the, the data models. So th this is the, the idea. And uh, the, the buff is uh, happening uh, Tuesday in 12 days. Um, it's called ASDF, a semantic definition format. It's a non-working group form forming buff because uh, some people thought we need to have this this uh, um, dialogue about what what 1DM and, and SDF and all the other SDOs in this space are about, and whether we even can find a, um, a way to work together a common process that is not uh, stuck in some IPR issues. And I think we, we are in a very good position uh, right now due to the work that 1DM uh, did, but we have to, to complete that and, and get people talking to each other. So this is the, the objective of the buff. And I would hope that uh, we can get people from all kinds of uh, uh, organizations uh, coming in and, and uh, explain how they are trying to work together using this uh, semantic definition format and how IETF could do its part in, in completing the specification. Any questions about that? Okay, in which case, we go on to Xavier. Thank you, Karsten. Yeah. So, uh, hi, so um, I'd like to present our progress on the draft uh, IoT Edge Computing Challenges and Functions uh, on behalf of my uh, co-authors. So could you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So I, I will not go um, over the uh, history of the draft. It's just here for reference and to show that basically we, you know, this uh, work started uh, two years ago and it evolved uh, quite uh, a lot. So today we are looking at revisions four and five and five is proposed for adoption. So we uh, addressed comments, uh, we completed uh, sections. Uh, so we will look uh, at this in the next slides. Thank you. So in the first part of the update, so we addressed comments uh, mostly from uh, Thomas on the list. Uh, there were improvements to section three, IoT challenges leading towards, you know, the adoption of edge computing. 
for example, uh, resilience to intermittent services now include enabling a cloud service to access a device currently asleep. And uh, hiding traffic patterns from devices is another privacy application of IoT edge computing. So there were also improvements to the uh, document structure. So we removed uh, the appendix. Uh, it was moved to another draft just for reference. And we moved also a section, uh, an overview section, uh, later in the draft, uh, just to improve the flow. And we made editorial fixes as well. And also, Ari uh, provided some comments. And we made a revision 5 prior to the call for adoption. So next slide, please. Right, thank you. Uh, the other part of the update was planned since the last IETF meeting. So we completed uh, sections four and five. So we, we added an example of distributed IoT edge computing next to the general model. And uh, we uh, the next one is a bit a major one. We added uh, research challenges associated with each uh, function that we identified. And then we uh, filled the security section with the positive and negative impacts uh, of edge computing. So I think altogether this kind of completes the, the, the draft itself. Uh, many editorial changes were also made to improve uh, clarity and flow. And um, in the next slide, we'll, uh, you know, since uh, there is, thank you, since uh, there is a call for adoption for this draft, I just would like to give a quick overview of what is in the document so that you can see if you are interested in uh, you know, looking at it and waiting in in the in the mailing list. So after the introduction, we have a background section covering IoT, cloud computing, edge computing, and with a few use cases. Um, and the the core is really of the document. That's really section three and four. So in section three, uh, we cover uh, IoT challenges leading leading towards the adoption of edge computing. We have uh, challenges that are time sensitivity, uplink cost, resilience to intermittent connectivity, and privacy and security. So th those are based on earlier work made uh, in, t in the T2TRG research group um, you know, before we started the draft. I think uh, Eve and Dirk were involved in this. Um, then uh, section four uh, describes uh, IoT edge uh, computing functions. So it starts with an overview of the current use of IoT edge computing based on a review of current standard research and industry projects, which is now in the separate draft. And uh, also it has a very simple uh, general model that we use basically to introduce a list of functions or components. And uh, those are organized in the three groups. Um, OAM, functional and application. Uh, so this classification is for, you know, really for clarity only. Uh, different systems or system designs may couple those functions in various ways. So we, here we are not prescribing one particular system design, but really trying to cover the different types of functions that you may find in IoT edge computing uh, systems. Uh, there is also a short discussion on simulation and emulation environments and the security considerations. So in conclusion, the last slide, uh, thank you. Uh, we believe, at least the co-authors believe, that the draft is now complete. So in conclusion, it, it, it really introduces edge, IoT edge computing and it describes why we need it. So that's the first part. And also it describes a simple architecture model. It lists major functions and associated uh, research challenges. So um, as a conclusion, uh, you know, we think it provides context for future work in this area in IRTF to be used as a reference and also to provide some context on how you know, future work um, basically uh, relates to other parts. Um, Right, so uh, the, a good review which was made since last ITF helped fixing some issues with the flow and reduce the size of the draft. And so now we propose a draft uh, for adoption. 
and if you are interested, please review and provide some uh, feedback on the list. So, thank you. And Karsten, back to you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Xavier. Um, so are there any questions about what Xavier presented? So we, we have the adoption call running, so you, you can respond to the uh, research group adoption call. Uh, when is it running out? Does anyone remember? I think we can get two weeks started on Monday, so we can have to go. I have a question uh, at this point. Good. Hi, Xavier. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. Uh, uh, there was the last email about the call for uh, adoption of this draft, and uh, it was mentioned that in the end, uh, it's also interested to hear about uh, further reviews. So I wanted to know if there are still uh, places for open comments in these documents or on, only minor editorial changes. Oh, um, th thank you for the question. I mean, um, I think that here the call is for adoption by the research group, which means uh, it will change in the future. Uh, that is uh, basically, instead of being driven by the, auth the authors, it becomes uh, driven by the group. And uh, as a personal, uh, you know, uh, input on that, I think, for example, the, the, the research uh, uh, challenges that are listed, for example, that's a very yeah. good part where actually we need in input from people here. Like, for example, we heard uh, uh, today some uh, discussion. There was a discussion about discovery, and I think that's uh, also related to edge computing. So there is a part of on, on this in the research. Uh, challenges so anyway so that, that's my take on it maybe the chairs will have additional uh, so i think that. what xavier is trying to say is that yes please if you have interest in reviewing it please review it that would be very yeah, helpful. Will, actually, um, it's not uh, fixed uh, by any stretch of the imagination okay. you know it's like yeah. just uh being affiliated now officially with the working group yeah, I'm still yet to go through the full version because I recently was working on uh, the research on edge computing myself. So I may have some points to, uh, as a feedback or as a comment, or, or, or maybe some new points to add. So I was just wondering if this is the end of the draft or, you know, for the revisions are uh, on the page. So, uh, okay, I'll have a look. And then if there's anything, then I can maybe propose on the on the mailing list itself, or it would be a new version. No, I think please, please go on the mailing list and indicate if you would like the research group to uh, to continue this work basically that's what I, I believe that's what the call is about also so definitely uh, your input will be more than welcome thank you yeah sure thanks can you, can you put a link to that list or, or something in the minutes so we can find it more easily afterward afterwards yes uh, a link to to which part? Sorry, I'm, I didn't get Well, that. can you just give the name of the list in the minutes explicitly so we can find it, so we can, and also maybe a link to the draft so we can also find it more easily. Okay, so a link to the draft, and you mean a list, a, a link to the uh, call for adoption email? Uh, yeah, so if there's a mailing list at our call, uh, and, and so, we, so we can follow up. I will say I'm 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 going to be uh, reviewing and putting in my support here. In fact, I just wrote a for what edge computing use case, and I want to align that with this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Please um, provide uh, feedback and input on this. Uh, that would be very happy to uh, to integrate uh, and to to grow the the, the document. Because I, I think the course has really provided, we provided what we could, but I think now that's a time where where we need more input. Yeah, there's also an activity going on in web and networks around edge computing right now in W3C that I think is also maybe relevant. And I can point you some stuff there if you're interested. Thank you. So um, just to, to uh, throw up a few more things that people might want to think about, uh, the questions that came up in, in previous discussions of this uh, focused on, on two questions that I think we, we, we will continue discussing when this becomes a research uh, group document and, and we, we can 
start thinking more about it now. Um, one question was whether edge computing actually is a sharp technical term, or is it actually just a marketing term? And uh, there are maybe one or more concepts uh, behind that trying to get out uh, that would apply beyond where where the marketing term edge computing uh, works. So I, I, I don't want an answer right now. I just want to throw up the, the, the question. Uh, so I think that that's one of the things that we try to, to uh, do in a research group, uh, really sharpen the terminology and, and understand what the terminology uh, implies and does not imply and, and how it can be useful on a technical level. And uh, the other thing was that uh, the Kutcher had a nice uh, outrageous opinion talk a while ago uh, where he uh, came up with a number of uh, uh, requirements that, that really must be met for, for edge computing to actually happen, uh, to, to be widely deployed. And I think that's also something that, that uh, me, we, me, uh, we might want to uh, pick up and, and discuss in more uh, detail. What, what are the success factors uh, here and of course the success factors are not all technical. Some of them are actually uh, very much uh, commercial. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good idea to, to think about those as well. So we don't have uh, a nicely structured item of work that, that is not being used uh, anywhere. So these were the, the these would be the two things where, where I would like to see more more input and, and reviews and, and in the discussion on the mailing list. Any other comments? Thank you. In which case, uh, uh, we are done with the uh, agenda. Um, as I said, we are probably going to have a summary meeting uh, before the before or with IETF uh, 109 again. And in the me meantime, there is the mailing list that was just uh, posted to the chat. Uh, and we also will have the, the regular wishing calls on, on one of our uh, uh, subjects. And that doesn't mean that we cannot have regular calls on other subjects as well. Uh, it's just that Rishi seems to have a lot of energy uh, at the moment. So any last words from somebody else? Thank you. So we made it on time and have a nice IETF 108. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Good one. Bye. Thank you. Bye.